thank you for coming tonight. Um, it's our pleasure to have you here for, for this event. I'm just going to briefly um, go over the, what's happened today. This is uh, the Iowa State Game Development Competition. That's why we're here. Uh, we've invited um, some, some judges to come up and, and, and judge the event. So this is capping what we've been doing all day. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to have a speaker. And then afterward, we're going to uh, give out and announce the awards. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do right now is, is go ahead and introduce you to our, our, our speaker who comes from California, born in California, and uh, raised right next to us in, in Nebraska, and then has lived in uh, Salt Lake City and Germany and France also, um, and then North Carolina, and then is now back and coming to us from Salt Lake City. Um, he's worked for, uh, and of course is, is coming to us from the game industry, um, and he's, he's uh, worked for Kodiak uh, Interactive, uh, Acclaim Entertainment, Crytek, uh, Vicious Cycle Software, and uh, is now uh, at Disney Interactive Studios. He's worked on games um, such as uh, Jerry Mc, Jerry Mc, uh, Jeremy McGrath Supercross 2000, uh, Legends of Wrestling 2, Circus Maximus Chariot Wars, Far Cry, Dora the Explorer, Journey to the Purple Planet, Spy vs. Spy, Robotech Invasion, Meet the Robinsons, and Toy Story 3. Um, and I like to add he did do a um, comic book called Dracula Return of the Impaler, version number four, right? So it's, uh, it's my pleasure, and I hope we can give him a, a warm ISU welcome to Nathan Sumption. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I was uh, very impressed with the games that were shown in the competition today. It was uh, it was really nice to see um, not only a lot of creative projects, but uh, projects that were presented well, completed well. Uh, I just really wanted to give you a uh, you know some kudos to a uh, really nice job. Um, when I was asked to come judge, I was trying to think of something that I could. Uh, talk to you about uh, kind of what a game designer does and so I'm going to uh, briefly talk to you a little bit about um, kind of how game designers communicate, um, a little bit about what um, kind of the roles that we do uh, when we design games. So this, uh, Anson covered most of this already, this is, these are just some of the games that I've worked on and I'll pull out a, a few examples from games that I've worked on of you know kind of the different kinds of things that you do when you're designing a game. So uh, a question that I'm asked a lot is what do game designers do? In fact, you know I, I've been doing this for almost 13 years now and um, one of our neighbors actually this was a couple weeks ago asked my wife what exactly does your husband do and she couldn't really answer the question. Um, I think when, when most people think of what does a game designer do, uh, this is the typical image. I know this is the Hollywood image of what game designers are. Guys that sit on couches, um, playing games all day, and you know somehow out of that process uh, some gem comes out. Now I know that uh, for most of the crowd here I know how much work you, you know, obviously put into your projects. You know that uh, this is not the lifestyle of a typical designer. Uh, maybe there's a couple of them out there, but I haven't met them yet. Um, so some of the things that uh, a designer is responsible for, um, you know, designing the systems of the game, designing the mechanics of the game, th these are um, just a few of the things that as a designer, um, we have to address in, in some way, um, be able to explain to the development team um, and other people how each of these things is going to be uh, addressed in the game. 
So these, um, these different aspects, uh, I, I like to say that we're, you know, one of the reasons it's so hard to define what a designer does is because we, we're the ones that put the fun in the games. Um, and that's not to say that, uh, you know, artists or programmers that are working on the game don't understand fun. Um, what I'm just saying is that somehow we have to try and communicate these ideas that we have in our heads, these ideas that we've written down on paper, you know, somehow communicate to a, a programmer or an artist, this is why this thing is going to be fun. And if we can ex communicate it right to the development team, they can use their skills to uh, you know, really bring it that, that next step forward and uh, make it something that you know, people want to play. Um, so I'll, t I'll talk just a little bit about um, you know, some of these different things. Um, now, you know, I, I think even um, you know, among people in the industry, it's like, well, why, you know, why do we need a designer? Why you know, can't just anyone on a team um, do these things? You know, everyone plays video games. Everyone kind of knows, uh, you know, has games that are fun to them. Um, you know, and uh, the, the kind of games that I work on um, are, you know, even though they're, you know, like Disney children's games, um, they have a fairly high uh, quality bar that we have to meet. And in order to put these games out on the shelves, it's becoming um, more and more difficult and involves more and more work to, you know, get that finished project. Um, just to give you an example of how team sizes have changed from when I started 13 years ago to now, um, on the first couple games that I worked on, they were for, um, if some of you may remember, uh, Dreamcasts, Nintendo 64s, uh, Playstations, before there were numbers after the Playstation. Um, it would take about 30 people to put one of those games together. Uh, as the consoles got a little bit more advanced, the numbers started getting bigger. Um, when I was on Far Cry, we had um, times, uh, it was generally around 45 people at any one time, even though over the course of the project we had about 120 developers working on it. Um, as we get now to the current generation of games, um, when I worked on Meet the Robinsons, we had about 70, 75 people on one team working on this project and you know trying to keep uh, everyone on task understanding you know how their little piece fit into the overall picture was very important um, when we moved to Toy Story 3 which was a much bigger game um, we had about 200 people on the team that uh, you know as designers we were responsible for making sure everyone understood uh, you know exactly what they were doing and uh, my current project um, that number's even gone up higher so uh, you know imagine trying to <sighs> design new concepts that haven't been seen in games um, you know or even some things that we maybe uh, you know that maybe has been seen before but we're uh, putting a new spin on it trying to get you know, make, make sure that the levels all fit with each other, um, you know, fit into the kind of overall uh, bigger picture can be very challenging sometimes. So um, what, I, what I wanted to address tonight was kind of the th three of the groups that as a designer or, you know, really as any developer in a game that you're going to be trying to communicate to and some ideas on how to better do that. Uh, so the three important groups I'm gonna talk about are um, talking to a publisher, talking to your development team, and then a few ideas about talking to your players. Um, so there are you know, various ways of communicating, um, and I'm, I'm gonna say this multiple times tonight, but um, you know, learning to know how to communicate to each group is very important. A lot of times it's the same information, um, how you, you know, what parts of that information are critical uh, can change depending on uh, each group. So um, I think one of the key things I'm asked a lot is about game design documents. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it, but there, there is no 
like t uh, there's no template that must be followed for a game design document. I've um, you know been on some projects where you know the, the game design document was 200, 300 pages. Uh, I mean, just a brick that you would plunk down on someone's desk. Um, and I've been on other projects where it was 40 pages, and that covered everything that the game needed to, to communicate. Um, and then, depending on the situation, there are different types of documents that you need to write. Uh, currently, on the project I'm working on, it's in the pre-production phase, which means we're trying to figure out exactly what the game is before uh, the majority of the team comes on to actually make it. And so, it's pretty document intensive right now. We're still trying to figure out how we can tie all these ideas together and make sure everyone understands them correctly. Um, numerous presentations are, are involved. Uh, one, one thing I learned early on um, was that uh, right, just having a design document in hand is not sufficient. Uh, a lot of times, especially when you're uh, presenting to uh, a team of marketing people or people that um, you know may not be familiar with a lot of the, I guess, jargon that we take for granted, uh, being familiar with video games. Um, you know, someone that's just trying to sell the game isn't necessarily interested in how you've tweaked the, you know, your units and how they're balanced and, um, you know, how many, what they want to know is basically the, the bullet points on the back of the box. And uh, so, you know, trying to boil down your idea in a very, uh, succinct way uh, can be very important um, and you know v visually communicating is a big key in your presentations um, use lots of pictures uh, so and well, I, I don't know how well you can see these but um, I've got a few pictures in this presentation that uh, you know fortunately uh, since I work for Disney there are you know, some of the really the best artists in the country that are working for our studio and so it, it's pretty it's definitely a change from the days when I would you know try and scribble something out on a piece of paper and say you know I need the ninja to look like this and you know it's a little stick figure with a pointy sword and uh, you know and now we can turn to you know a team of Disney concept artists and say you know we just we want we want a nice flowery kind of uh, My Little Pony-like fairy glade, and they can come back with something that just, you know, amazes us. Um, just a quick note about meetings. Got to have them. Uh, the, I think the, the key is making sure you don't invite too many people to your meetings, making sure they don't take too long, and uh, try and get out of them as quickly as possible. Uh, and then the, uh, I think one of the, the key things of being a designer is um, not necessarily, basically you are in charge of all the information and so being the person that can quickly dispense the information is important. Um, pe people are not gonna read your documents. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky if people read the emails that I send them to tell them where documents are. Uh, you know. It, Especially if you've got some 400-page masterpiece with your epic storyline, and uh, no, no one's going to read it. So, um, you know, I, I think I was I was literally floored when we submitted Toy Story 3, and we submitted it to Sony, and the producer down at Sony that's responsible for view, reviewing the submissions actually had questions for us. You know, he was like, "I I love this game design document." You know, what does this thing mean here on page 73? What does this thing mean? And w we were just stunned that someone had actually read the document. So, um, you know, but it's, it's a good reference as the designer to know where that information is and so you can um, get it to other people. So, let me talk a little bit about communicating to your publisher. Um, and I've got, I, I tried to write some notes down of some fun stories that I could tell because I guess as, uh, just over the last couple of days as I was uh, forcing Anson to listen to some of my stories, uh, there were a couple funny little nuggets in there, so I, I'll, I'll try and uh, mention a couple of those. Um, when, you're, when you're pitching your idea, 
and, and this is a, a rough process. It's not typically something I deal with right now because uh, Disney, we, pr we develop and publish our own games. But when I was working for uh, Vicious Cycle for Kodiak, you know, we, we would have to try and entice, you know, basically here's this great idea we have for a game. Give us a couple million dollars so that we can go make it. And, you know, trying, to, and you're one of dozens of developers that are saying the same thing to publishers. How do you make your idea stand out? Um, typically on a pitch, you know, your initial pitch, if it's more than four pages, again, no one's going to read it. It needs to be very concise, bullet points, pretty pictures. Uh, you, you want them to just get, you know, if you can hook them uh, with the concept, with the nice ideas, then they'll start asking deeper questions. Um, if you have a game demo, that's even better. Although, if you if you have a game demo, make sure that it's complete enough that they can get the idea. Uh, I, I've seen a few times where because the game demo was so clunky, uh, it you know basically the publisher had no confidence in that developer and uh, was not interested in listening further. So, um, the, you know, typically the, the, the high points that you want to hit in a pitch, you know, just really, again, it's the bullet point on the back of the box approach. How many levels is it? Is it multiplayer? Uh, what kind of genre is it? I mean, you know, really, even if, you know, even if you truly believe that your, your idea you know, transcends all genres. It's something that the world has never seen before. A marketing department is going to have a very hard time figuring out where to put that uh, if they have nothing to measure it against. Um, don't, don't be afraid to say, you know, I've got this uh, idea for a new, you know, first-person shooter. It's a space marine, but here's the new hook. You know, here's something that here's the one thing that's never been seen before. And that can, you know, be a good uh, starting point uh, for the publisher to understand what it is. Um, and this just, you know, really, you know, just to kind of highlight the difference between, um, you know, how, how some of the uh, development works in the, in the industry. Um, you know, like I said, with Vicious Cycle, it was a third-party developer. So that meant we would approach publishers to try and entice them to fund our projects. Or they would, you know, they would have some movie that they were looking for a video game tie-in for, and so they would field submissions from developers to uh, do those movies. Um, and with most third-party developers, they live kind of project to project. I mean, there's a few, you know, like uh, I guess Bioware before they were bought by EA, um, Blizzard before they were bought by Activision. Um, they were developers that had enough funds that they could, you know, they could self-fund their projects, and then say, "Here's our completed game," and go to a publisher and, uh, you know, negotiate a better deal. Typically, for small studios, um, you, you know, you're you are trying to get that funding in order to make the game. Um, you know, w with Disney, we we fund our own development, so uh, the green the green light process is a little not quite as hairy for us. Uh, you know, if we, if we, for some reason, one of our ideas gets shot down, it's probably not the end of the world. You know, we take a credibility hit, but it's not necessarily a, you know, studio shutting down hit. Um, so, w one of the games I worked on, and I just wanted to kind of give you a quick example of um, this pitch process, uh, was a game called Deadhead Fred. Uh, it was uh, when I was working at Vicious Cycle. Um, again, we were, you know, getting towards the end of our current project, um, which was, I, I'm pretty sure it was Dora the Explorer. And it was kind of funny going from Dora to this, but um, there was a new publisher um, that had a presence in Japan, but they were trying to uh, make inroads into North America, and they were uh, D3P uh, Publishing. And what they were trying to do was the the Sony PSP was fairly new at the time, and so they wanted to establish a an original IP an original brand on the Sony PSP. So they were asking developers submit us original ideas um, that will be exclusive to the PSP. 
so um, you know, we, we looked at what the target demographic was for the PSP. It was a slightly older audience. So we wanted to pitch something that was not um, necessarily something you would find on the Nintendo, uh, the Nintendo DS at the time. So uh, the game we pitched, uh, Deadhead Fred, the private investigator, that uh, his brain was in a jar and he had different abilities based on what heads he pulled off of opponents and stuck over his own. And so if he, you know, if he grabbed a, a, a zombie's head and put it on, he could inflate his head and you know, float up past obstacles. If he had uh, a stone idol head, he could put that on, he'd be impervious to a lot of damage and he could sink down into the water. So it was a very kind of puzzle-based uh, platformer. Uh, definitely with a more mature edge. Um, so th th this was the game that, um, and this is the concept that I helped come up with, and you know, so we had basically had our four page, this is how cool this game's gonna be, you know, this is gonna be the greatest thing ever. Um, D3P received about 40, if I understand, or it was around 40 submissions, and they picked their top five. Um, of the ones that they wanted to look at. And, and sometimes it wasn't necessarily, oh, these are the five best ideas, but it's, um, you know, well, we've got, I know one of our other ideas that we had submitted to Namco a little while earlier, they loved the idea, but they already had another game in the same genre on the same platform coming out in around that same time, so they wouldn't take it. Uh, so D3P, took those five um, proposals and they went and visited each studio and they said, okay, show us your tech, you know, show us your team size, show us the, you know, your team breakdown, um, how much money you're going to need in order to complete the job. And it was really, you know, on the strength of the technology that Vicious Cycle had that the publisher said, okay, out of, you know, out of these top five, you know, you're the studio that we think is going to be able to pull this project off and uh, they went with that. So, um, Deadhead Fred, the follow-up to Dora the Explorer. Um, it's, uh, it, it was a fun, it was a fun project to be involved with. Uh, I don't, don't know that there's gonna be a Deadhead Fred too, but uh, it, was, it was fun while it lasted. Um, so when you're, when you're pitching your ideas, um, you know, ultimately, these are the things that a publisher needs to be able to understand very quickly. Um, and, you know, because really they are, you know, they're, they're essentially gambling millions of dollars uh, on a project that uh, you're, you're promising you can deliver. So, um, let's, yes, okay. I wanted to make sure I wasn't forgetting one of my stories. I think I'm on track. So, um, just really quick, so now, you know, assuming that you have pitched your idea to the publisher, the publisher has said, yes, we're gonna fund this project. You know, so you've, you've got the green light, what are you, what are you doing now? Um, this is the time for uh, essentially the high concept phase. Um, so you need to, you know, give a, an over, kind of the overarching idea of, to your team, this is what we're making, this is the scope of the project, this is the, the kind of things that we're going to be um, you know, looking at. Um, these, are, these are some pictures from Toy Story 3, just, uh, I mean, you know, we, we had a fuzzy little dragon, we had some, um, you know, one, one, of the, one of the parts of Toy Story 3 was, uh, it was called the toy box mode, where you had, uh, you were basically Woody or Buzz or Jesse, you were the sheriff of a western town, and we, we really wanted something that you could customize, really make your own. And so in order to do that, um, if we had Toy Story characters throughout the town, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that the Toy Story characters resembled the ones from the film. Uh, those models in the film are you know, incredibly high, um, high poly counts, you know, the textures were insane. I mean, we couldn't have a, l a lot of those in the game. So we, we needed to come up with some way of, uh, you know, having a character that can, we can easily populate a town with and swap assets in and out. And so we, 
created um, these little, we call them blockheads, you know, just a very simple, you know, kind of preschool age toy that um, made sense to swap clothes in and out of. Um, so when we're in the, this um, pre-production phase, um, this is where we're prototyping our concepts out. You know, this is where we're coming up with our ideas. This, we think this is going to be fun. Let's try it out. Let's get it in the game. And, you know, just, just basically doing our experimenting and uh, trying to get everything in line. Um, I, I, I think this would be a, probably a pretty good place to tell one of my, one of my stories. Um, I, the, uh, when I worked at Crytek, the other guys that I worked with affectionately called this the uh, ambush in Paris. Um, when I went to work at Crytek, this was in Germany, and um, most of the day-to-day -day business was done in English there. I, I, I don't speak any German, but um, I, I do speak fluent French, and not a lot of people knew that. I didn't make a big deal out of it when I went out there. And the, the game was being published by Ubisoft, which is based in Paris. And so the, the owners of the company knew that I spoke French, and they didn't tell anybody. So when I got there, they hustled me into as many meetings as they could where the Ubisoft producers were showing up. And so the, I, they'd sit me right next to the Ubisoft producers, and uh, the Ubisoft guys would be talking back and forth with each other in French because no one else in the room understood French, or so they thought. And so th this went on for a couple weeks while, you know, I, I could just, I, I understood what they were saying about the game and I could give feedback and stuff like that. Um, well, I was, after I'd been at Crytek for about a month, I was um, nominated to go up to Paris to present the game to all the creative heads of Ubisoft. So basically I was told, okay, you're gonna be doing an hour and a half presentation Here's your copy of the game, off you go. And so when I got to meet with Ubisoft, I you know, was in the room, all the, you know, the major designers, creative directors, and things were there, and I launched into my presentation in French. And the two producers that were there that had been you know, visiting for a month, their, their jaws just dropped. You could just see the terror in their eyes, like, oh no, what have we been saying for the last month? Um, that was, and the, the guys I worked with, they're still, you know, every, every time I talk to them now, they, they mention the ambush in Paris because uh, it turned out it wasn't an hour and a half presentation, it was a day and a half presentation. And the build that I got sent with was broken. So I had to stretch uh, what we were doing when I couldn't show any of it and uh, just goes to illustrate as a designer, you know, be prepared. <laughs> be, I mean, talk about anything you can think of. Uh, what, what I found to do is best to do in a room full of designers is just lob out design questions. Just, uh, I would say things like, you know, what do you suggest would be a good way of a stealth mechanic on a jungle island? And I could just sit back and just watch the frenzy of designers go back and forth as they were, you know, saying ideas and, you know, kill a couple hours at a time that way. Um, but, um, you know, wh when we're in the, th this pre-production phase, it, you know, it is a lot of, you know, okay, you know, in Far Cry, it's, there's a stealth mechanic. Well, lots of games have done stealth mechanics. Why is ours different? You know, it's, it's a first-person shooter. Uh, well, you know, big deal. There's been tons of first-person shooters. Why is ours different? And, uh, you know, identifying these key reasons that makes your game stand apart from everything else is uh, very important in this initial, initial pre-production. Um, and just because I work for Disney now, I, I brought some concept art that, uh, from the past couple of games that I've worked on. And, um, you know, it, these, uh, you know, early concept pieces are really important for, you know, establishing, you know, mood. Um, you know, just looking at one picture does so much more than, you know, three or four pages of written description of what a haunted house is. We wanted a haunted house toy that you could bring into your western town. And the idea was when you brought this haunted house toy in, 
the sky would change, ghosts would appear in your town, um, you know, you could give your little blockheads spooky clothes and outfits, and, you know, we could, we could talk about that for a while, present it for a while, but just showing this one uh, image, you know, people could kind of get the idea, okay, yes, it looks toy-like, it looks spooky, we, you know, we understand. So, um, you know, trying to come up with, uh, you know, solid art direction is uh, every bit as important as the design. Um, so these are just some of the, you know, early mock-ups and ideas that we were doing in uh, Toy Story 3. And then I think I've got a couple. Yeah, this is from uh, Meet the Robinsons. We, when we were doing Meet the Robinsons, we wanted to, instead of just telling, retelling the story of the movie, we wanted to uh, intersect the movie at key points. And so we were able to create kind of new new areas in the story that the movie didn't address and uh, you know new characters that you know fit with the style of the movie but uh, obviously weren't in the film so currently how we you know in the, in the past few games that I've worked on our communication process is essentially you know the designers get together we come up with our concepts we make sure that all of design is on the same page. This is what we want to do. We then take those and get the buy-off of the leads of the different disciplines. You know, it's, it's fine for all the designers to say, we want to have this, you know, city the size of New York, and it's, you know, streams in constantly, and it's full of thousands of people. But if our programming lead says, you know, yeah, that's, ridiculous, you can't have that. Uh, you know, obviously we need to scale back. We need to find solutions that'll work with our tech. Um, and then one, once we've got the, you know, basically the leads of the different disciplines have said, yes, that's, that's something that we can deliver in this amount of time. Um, then we present it to the rest of the team and we present it to uh, our upper managers who they have to then go to the publisher and you know, make sure it fits with all the brand requirements and uh, is what the publisher is expecting to get for their money. So at the end of pre-production, um, the basics of the full design should be in, pl in place. You, you, we have a plan to move forward. Uh, we have game design documents written, our, our you know, technical and uh, visual uh, expectations are in place. And um, hopefully, any new mechanics that we're introducing are at least, uh, you know, we've at least begun to test those. Because a lot of times, something that sounds great on paper uh, does not work when, once you get it, you know, into a level and working. Uh, you know, and even, you know, there have been times where, you know, we've, we've implemented something, it does work, but it's just not, you know, as fun as we had expected it to be. Uh, this, this is, you know, it's very good to discover those things here before you pull your whole team in and start building all the assets and get, you know, a ways into your game before you realize, oh, this, this is not going to be done. Um, all right. Now, I, I, I usually don't like to point out uh, things that I haven't done as bad examples. I'm, I don't mind pointing out stuff that I do that are bad examples. Um, but there was, one particular case that I, I just I just had to bring up um, when I was at uh, you know one of my previous companies we were asked to take a look at something that another studio was uh, developing for this publisher and I, I'm not I don't know how many of you are familiar with this character his name's Lobo he's a comic book character bad attitude you know kind of hyper violent um, just you know really in your face angry character. Um, the entire 100 page game design document was written in his voice. So every level description, every game mechanic description was written as if he was talking. And it was, it was maddening to try and, you know, say, okay, level designer, make this level about space penguins. And the level designer has to try and read through, you know, all the 
angry verbs and uh, you know just the character basically yelling at uh, yelling at the reader. Um, you know, those kinds of examples make great pitches. They make great high concept documents. Um, you know, don't torture the people that are making your game by uh, staying in character like that. Um, I, you know, I, I wish I could remember some of the you know specific phrases that just killed me. Um, yeah, there's you know, know where to uh, apply that kind of creativity, and again, you know, especially if you do something like that, no one's ever going to read your documents, so don't do that. Um, and that's that's also going to be a reoccurring theme of some talking is, uh, y you know, it, it's kind of. I, I think I've written more stuff that uh, people. How, I mean, how do I how do I even say this? I've written more stuff that people haven't read than written stuff that people have read. I guess that doesn't really make sense, but I've, I've written pages and pages of things that uh, I'm probably the only person that's ever looked at. So just, you know, some basically uh, the key thing with a game design document, anything about the game should be there. Um, you know, it should be spelled out, all your, all your systems in place, all your mechanics uh, detailed. Um, again, probably what what I use this for is a reference for me. So when someone on the team says, hey, you know, uh, what is this particular level supposed to look like? I can, you know, send them the link to that particular section. I can copy and paste the description. Here it is, you know, just a little quick bite of what they, the information they need. Um, yeah, just make the information easy to find. So another key thing about the game design document, uh, it is not set in stone. It will change. It will, um, you know, when we were making Meet the Robinsons, um, you know, fortunately, uh, I'd had some experience with movie design or movie games in the past. And one of the reasons we lobbied so hard to not retell the story of the movie is because anytime the movie got tweaked or changed, that would require us to tweak or change our story. Um, so, you know, it was fortunate in the case of Meet the Robinsons because about halfway through development, Disney purchased Pixar and John Lasseter became the creative director of Disney. And so he came in and made some pretty significant changes to the story of Meet the Robinsons, which would have just destroyed our development had we been following that story of the movie. Um, just expect, you know, as things progress, Keep your document updated. Uh, I'll guarantee the first time you send someone to read a part of your document that's out of date and they start doing something wrong because it's what you told them to do, uh, they're not going to trust you again. Uh, just it, it's important for a designer to keep up to date with, uh, you know, as, as best we can with changes. Um, so I, I, I just put a couple examples up here of different methods I've seen for game design documents. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much into them, but you know, obviously Microsoft Word is the kind of the, the default. It's the most logical. You can print it out. You can hand it to somebody. It's you know, easy to index, uh, find information. Um, I know that the uh, Crytek team started doing PowerPoint slides. Um, wh when I was working on Far Cry with them, I believe there were, of the 45 team members that were there, there were 16 different nationalities. And uh, for a lot of them, English was their third or their fourth language. And so actually, I think that was my next story, yes. The, the very first thing I was asked to do when I got to Crytek was write up how the flashlight is going to work. And so I wrote this r beautiful three-page document, every possible thing that uh, you know had to do with how the flashlight was supposed to work, and you know when I started handing it to the team, you know I was getting a lot of blank stares, glassy eyes. Uh, you know they just it was too much information. It was a lot of um, you know things that you know a lot of the guys you know extremely intelligent guys that they just didn't have time to try and figure out what I was saying in three pages. When you know so the, the next day I was like okay. Here's your eight bullet points. Uh, these are the key things that the flashlight needs to do, and, and you know, and that was um, much better, as uh, much more quickly implemented. Um, 
you know, we've done some work with wikis. Uh, wikis were really nice because so many different people on the team could input information. It didn't all have to come through a designer. Uh, what we did find, though, was that anytime someone wanted like a, a comprehensive listing of, you know, like where's the game design document, it was kind of difficult to pull everything together in a format that was easy to use. And uh, we've tried OneNote before. Um, I think OneNote might work with a smaller team. Uh, it was it was pretty fun to, you know, just be able to uh, you know throw things in so quickly, and it was a great brainstorming tool. But uh, when you have 200 people contributing to you know kind of a communal uh, just you know whiteboard space, basically, uh, it got out of hand really quickly. We couldn't tell what was new, what was old, what was you know the most current information. It was a real mess. So. Um, I'd say a good tool for a small team, but uh, I would not recommend it for a big team unless you're much better organized than I am. Um, so just, you know, the, the last thing I kind of wanted to hit um, was, uh, well, I'm, I guess I missed one of my stories. I'm just going to tell it really quick. Uh, you know, when we're working on games for, especially for Pixar, uh, one of the, I guess, perks is that we get to see the movie very early in the production of the movie. Uh, when we were working on Toy Story 3 and Meet the Robinsons, we got to see movies um, when they were still in like their storyboard form. And, um, you know, really, Avalanche has kind of developed a very unique relationship with Pixar. Uh, I think we're, um, you know, trusted. They, they like how we interpret their movies into video games. And so we've had kind of unprecedented access to a lot of their stuff. And... Uh, so one time they were going to show us an early screening of a film. Um, they actually rented an entire theater out. They hired security uh, to monitor the event. We got we got searched going into the theater. Um, we had to leave all of our cell phones behind, any cameras, recording devices. Couldn't bring anything like that in. Um, and when they rented the movie out, they actually rented the movie. They they told the theater that it was going to be Beauty and the Beast that they were showing for all of us. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until, um, you know, the guy showed up with, like, the one copy of the film that uh, I think I think it was Disney's own projectionist that came out so that we could show it so no one else would see it. Um, I know on a, on a different project, the Pixar guy that came out to show us an early screening of the film, it was on a thumb drive, and it was actually a self-destructing file. He plugged it in, he hit play, and as soon as that thing was done, it destroyed itself. Uh, I mean, just very, very serious about their security. So it's, uh, it's kind of fun, you know, being able to, but being able to see kind of their creative process has been uh, very educational for us, too. Uh, so just the last area I wanted to, I just wanted to, kind of a few of my recommendations on, you know, how to communicate to your players. Um, one of the things that, you know, really in a, especially in a console game, a PC game, um, you are, you know, not only uh, are you giving the game to the player, you are presenting, you are teaching the player how to play your game. Everything that the player knows about your game is typically coming from you to them. Um, you know, one of the, uh, you know, it's just, when we have someone come in to like play our level, uh, you know, like if I if I've laid a level out, set up the gameplay, have someone come in to play it, I have to just step back, not say anything, and you know try and see how they do it. Uh, you know, we can't ship a designer with every copy of the game. You know, it's basically they have to be able to figure it out on their own. Um, so uh, j just a few examples of this that uh, I had. Now this is this is a copy or a, a screenshot from Half Life Two. When I was working at Crytek, um, Half-Life 2 was also in development. And at the, I believe it was the GDC, it was either the GDC or the E3 that year, um, they were demonstrating their gravity gun from Half-Life 2. Fantastic piece of, uh, you know, f physics engineering. And, um, you know, everyone, you know, all the developers came back to, to Crytek and we were talking about how cool it was. And our, you know, our physics programmer was, very upset. And he's like, we've got that in our game. We can do that easily with our current, you know, I mean, without even changing any code, it's there. 
And he's like, you know, why are you guys so excited about Half-Life 2? And, you know, and really the, uh, the fault with that was squarely on the designers. There was nowhere in any level that we had built, you know, physics puzzles uh, of anything like that. So, you know, having, um, you know, taking advantage of, you know, all this, uh, you know, power kind of under the hood of our engine, um, you know, as the designer, you need to make sure that the players have access to it. Um, you know, so that was, you know, one, one of the things that I did while I was there, you know, when I came in, the game was still a little unorganized, and one of my jobs was to kind of um, take all the levels that were being developed, um, you know, package them together in kind of a linear storyline um, so that they made sense flowing from one to another, uh, and the mechanics were introduced uh, logically. Um, something communicating visually to your player, I mean, how, how many games have you guys played that have exploding barrels? I, I mean, probably just, you know, about half of every game you play has an exploding barrel in it. The, uh, the reason the exploding barrel is so common is because it is such an easy concept to get across to your player. You, you have a bunch of barrels in a room, and you see that barrel. What happens when you shoot it? Everyone knows what happens when you shoot that barrel. And so the, you know, the trick is, well, okay, great. I shoot that barrel, it explodes, but how does my game do it differently? You know, and, and in Far Cry, yeah, we, we had exploding barrels. I, I lobbied very strongly for them um, because I, sh I shoot an exploding barrel and I put it next to a bunch of physics objects and those phys physics objects go everywhere. You know, I, they roll down hills, they, they knock guys over, you, I mean, there's just so many p different scenarios you can build around a concept that the player clearly understands. Um, so, you know, I, I don't need to be sitting behind, you know, over someone's shoulder saying, you know, this is how you do this. They can, they can clearly uh, see that on their own. And um, this is another, I, I guess, bad example that I, I like to point out. And I, I, won't, I won't even mention the game on this one, but it was a first-person shooter you know, kind of very gritty, industrial. Um, in the first several levels, there were all these pipes all around, and, you know, a few of them had these little crank wheels that you couldn't interact with. And so what that taught me as a player is I can ignore those. The, I can't interact with them. That's what the game has taught me. Um, I'm just going to go on my way and do things. Well, about halfway into the game, there's a level where you have to turn the crank wheel in order to shut something off to progress. And I, I probably spent an hour wandering around that level trying to figure what door did I miss, what you know, lever did I forget to pull, what's going on, and I it never, you know, and it was a big red crank wheel right in the middle of the level, but you know, the game had taught me ignore those. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples from uh, the original Half-Life you know, the, the tech guys had, um, you know, one of the, what's one of the first weapons you get in Half-Life? It's the crowbar. And there's lots of crates sitting around. You go up to a crate, you break the crate, it explodes, and they're like, isn't that cool? And in their early focus tests, what they were finding was players would see that they could break those crates open, and at the time, you know, that's all it did. The crate broke, and that was the end of it. And all of their focus testers were going through every level, breaking every single crate, convinced something was in one somewhere. And, you know, and that, had, that hadn't even been part of the design at that point was, you know, it was just this cool feature. Look, you can break crates with a crowbar. But um, they decided, you know, if players are going to do this, let's, let's put stuff in the crates. And, um, y you know, and I, I know when I play games like this, uh, if my kids try and... I mean, if, if there's crates to break, I'm breaking them. And I think it's Ultimate Alliance when I play with my kids. My kids hate playing that game with me because, you know, they just want to be Spider-Man or Wolverine and go around and beat people up and have fun and n not me. In every room, I'm like, there's barrels to break, there's crates to break, there's wall things I can knock down. And they're like, you know, Dad, come on. <laughs> um, but it's, it's because the game has taught me I can do that. I'm sure there's a reason for it, you know, besides just the, the thrill of breaking stuff. Um, 
which uh, leads me to these last two things and um, is just, you know, focus testing is so important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you've done uh, some focus testing on your, your projects that you were doing here today. Um, you know, we, we would create uh, levels when we were making the Western Town in Toy Story 3, we had the early missions were so easy. I mean, we thought, you know, kids are going to blaze through this in five minutes tops. And we got a bunch of eight-year-old kids to come in, and we actually had this nice little setup where, you know, they were, they were placed in front of computers. We were behind mirrors, so they couldn't see us. And uh, we just, we'd watch them play. And it was... It, it was amazing. I mean, we were just basically banging our heads in frustration because, you know, it would take an hour for the kids to get through, like, the first five minutes of our game because we were doing a poor job in communicating, you know, where they were supposed to go, uh, what the early goals were. I mean, we had this open-world environment, kind of a sandbox, go anywhere you want. And, uh, and so they were going anywhere they wanted, not where we wanted them to go. And uh, it was, you know... I mean, and we thought we had it down, and uh, you know, the focus testing—it's—it's it's invaluable. You—you uh, you cannot get a game done without bringing some people in that are completely unfamiliar with your game and seeing how they play it. It will give you uh, just you know um, information that is uh, critical to your game. Um, I mentioned tutorials here too. You know, again, you're teaching you're teaching your players how to play your game. Um, typically, just like developers on your team don't want to read pages and pages of text, your players probably aren't buying a video game to sit down and read pages and pages of text either. So, you know, try and come up with clever ways to teach your players how to play your game. Um, and there's my there's my summary. Just uh, you know, really, the, the key thing, you know, I can, I can tell you, you know, here's the best thing to do, here's the right thing to do, and for your particular project, your particular game, that's, you know, definitely not the right thing. So, you know, figure out what works well uh, in your situation and, uh, you know, and, and do that. Now, I do have, um, I don't know how much time I have, I was kind of just blazing through, but... I, I'm more than happy to answer a few questions. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. Five, five or ten minutes. Are there any questions that uh, anyone has that I can answer? Yes. Okay. So, so the question was, how did I get into the video game industry, and what recommendations do I have for other people that want to get into the industry as well? Um, Hold on a second. Sure. Um, before everybody leaves, I think what we'll do okay. is, uh, before everybody leaves, is announce the winners, and we're gonna we're gonna have an informal, uh, you know, reception after. So maybe if there's questions there, uh, sure, we, we can answer them in that form. But I, I, won't, I think we want to announce the winners before people start leaving. Okay. Um, Thank you. Even get to my uh, what are we doing here? Okay, okay, do you want to maybe then assist just the dean? And the, and the, I think he's just gonna, yeah, I'll, I'll hand him out. Okay. Okay, we're gonna we are gonna get to the next part, which is announcing the winners of our competition. Um, we are gonna we're pleased to have the dean uh, of the College of Design, uh, Luis Rico Gutierrez, come up and uh, uh, announce our winners. Okay, thank you, Anson. Uh, I'll be brief and quick before everybody leaves. I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think we'll just look. I've got these in order here, so what you see here is what we'll announce. Okay. Um, 
being a dean, you know, is sometimes has its ups and downs. Sometimes, you know, you do tough decisions and people hate you. Sometimes you do the right thing and you feel relief, you know. And sometimes you get to do something a lot of that is a lot of fun just because you have to do it, you know. I'm, 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 I'm here just to give a lot of money and that's great. <laughs> it's not my money, even. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Anson, for that. <laughs> uh, but now, uh, seriously, uh, thank you. Um, the reason you can do that here today is because of the, the, the three, three things. One is the faculty, so um, the people that have been made this true, uh, Anson, uh, Chris, uh, uh, can we just give you a round of applause? <laughs> Same thing, Nathan, thank you for being here, and uh, all the judges, you know, thanks for your time. <laughs> and the reason I said, you know, it's not my money, is it's actually Motorola's money. So uh, Motorola actually gave $50,000 to sponsor this competition, and that is just amazing. Uh, even if Motorola is not in the room, you know, that's worth, you know, another round of applause. <laughs> And the last thing is, you know, all of these things is because of the effort of the students. So everybody that is here, all of you, you know, I know that everybody says, you know, you already won. Some people are going to get some checks today, and that's great. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, uh, even if you don't get a check today, you're probably going to get a check later in your life because of this experience, and that's really worth it. So uh, thanks for your effort, and thanks for doing, uh, uh, participating in this class. So without further ado, Let's begin with the money. The first three categories, we have first, second, and third place. For the first place, Actually, third place first. I, I'm going to begin with third, but I'm just going to tell them the amounts of money because I'm really, really amazed about this. Third place is getting $1,000. Second place is going to get 2500 And first place is getting $10,000. Wow, that's a lot of money. Okay. So let's begin with the um, um, first category, mobile. Um, third place is Vesuvi Studios. Um, so it's have one, member come up here. one member, if you can come. The three of, uh, all, all the members, please stand up. <laughs> clapping. <laughs> That's for you. And as they say, the check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're yes. Oh, yes. Oh. Second place. Uh, Motion Inc. <laughs> Somebody from Motion Inc. And uh, first place, ten thousand dollars. Well, before you announce that, by the way. Oh, whoa, 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 wait. Okay. <laughs> we wanted you to walk home with something like an Oscar statue, but uh, we, uh, these are these are them. They're, they're trefoil knots printed on the fourth floor of the College of Design building. So uh, they're they're 3D printed, but we'll, we'll we'll give those to the top team in each category. Okay. So let's do that. So first place, brrr, uh, Mammal Soft. <laughs> team photos, yes. So uh, please don't go. Uh, team photos will be made at the end, and we need to really record this day, so please be patient. So now on uh, PC console category, uh, third place, Drew and Steve Labs. <laughs> Second place, uh, Positive Threat. Great.
First place, broken light bulb. <laughs> Okay, this category is called serious category. That's great. Uh, third place is digit. <laughs> digit here. there. Second place, serious category, code blooded. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and the very serious first place is Nathos. <laughs> yeah. This is like, uh, you know, the elections for the president. We have also a popular vote. So uh, second place for the popular vote is Drew and Steve Labs. <laughs> the popular vote comes with $1,000 for second. So this adds up. To end the ceremony, but remember, don't go. We need to make the picture with the teams. First place for the popular vote is Mammal Soft. <laughs> um, thanks, you guys, for all of your hard work. Uh, there's really a lot of people to thank. Uh, thanks for the judges. Uh, for coming from far away to do this. Uh, thanks again to the teams that have put in a lot of hours. Um, tonight you can go home and die for a couple of days, and get some rest. Um, uh, thanks to Chris uh, for doing this with, with, uh, with me, and hopefully we can find a way to continue doing this. Uh, I know you're moving on, but uh, maybe some, some inner uh, institutional work. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, we, we do have some refreshments uh, right after this. Uh, so again, uh, thank you very much, and this, this is it. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>